Uh, first, I want to let you know we are recording this event, so uh, those who cannot join us tonight could view at a later date, but if you would prefer not to appear in the recording, please, uh, you should turn off your video. And additionally, I would ask that you keep yourself muted through the entirety of our event, but during the Q&A session, questions are going to be asked that uh, were sent to us in advance, but if time allows, we might take additional questions. And at that time, feel free to drop your questions in the chat and the chat will go directly to our event hosts. Oh, you know, over the past 11 years, I have had the privilege of interviewing uh, quite a number of our incredible alumni. In fact, some of them are on the screen tonight. And I have learned more about their accomplishments and how McDaniel played a key part in their path to success. Over and over again, I have heard of the transformational education these folks received and the special bonds that were formed with their professors, many of those which lasted well beyond their four years on the Hill. Every one of those stories has served as a wonderful reflection of the life-changing mission of this college and of the power of a liberal arts education. It's been an honor to lead those conversations and to welcome those alumni back on the Hill. But tonight, as you see, we've made a few changes in the program. As I near my retirement as president here on the Hill in June, my colleagues proposed this idea for a final smart talk that was a flip the script, if you will. So in just a few moments, I'm going to pass the mic and switch into the role of the interviewee. I can tell you, I liked it better on the other side. But before I do that, uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to our host tonight, Dr. Bren Upton. Bren is a professor and chair of the history department here at McDaniel, and he has served us since 2002. He teaches courses in intellectual history, African-American history, women's history, and modern US history. Bren served as the director of the honors program from 2015 to 2019, and is a two-time winner of the college's Distinguished Scholar Award. In addition to teaching, Bryn's a member of the college's diversity, equity, and inclusion team and the Society for U.S. Intellectual History. He's been a guest speaker for multiple events and organizations, including locally at Carroll County Public Library and Union Mills Homestead and at Towson University. He's also an accomplished author his excellent book entitled Hollywood and the End of the Cold War compares films from the late Cold War era with movies of similar themes from the post-Cold War era and pays particularly uh, attention to shifts in narrative that reflect changes in American culture, attitudes, and ideas. In 2018, Bryn served as president of the Maryland Collegiate Honors Council, and he led an effort there to modernize the organization, create a web presence, host the annual conference, and bring students into leadership roles. If that's not enough, Bren's also a coach for youth soccer and basketball, collegiate track and field, and a faculty advisor for the Ultimate Frisbee Club. So Bren, thank you so much for all that you do for McDaniel, and a special thanks for your willingness to be here tonight. It is my honor to have you lead this conversation and help me share the story. So Bren? Thank you, Roger. Uh, it's, it's great to be with you and to have this opportunity to serve as host tonight. Uh, before we jump into the Q&A portion of the event, I do wanna take a moment to reflect. Many things have changed over the 11 years uh, that you've been here, and we've been through a lot together as a college community, both celebrations and challenges. Back in 2010, when you took on the job as president, I'm sure you were not thinking or planning for political unrest, racial and social justice campaigns on a level we haven't seen since the 60s, or a global pandemic. Not to mention having a tornado touchdown just half a mile from campus in the middle of February, or when we experienced a blackout on campus that lasted for several days. Some things you just can't prepare for. We've also had some pretty big wins together. In your inaugural speech, you stated, it is time for McDaniel to shine in all its brilliance above the plane of American higher education. I think a lot of us were tired of being called a best kept secret and the secret got out. Over the past 11 years, McDaniel has received tremendous national recognition. I'll name just a few. We've been ranked as the number one best value regional university in the North in US News and World Report's 2021 
best colleges rankings for a second consecutive year. We were named amongst the Princeton uh, Review's best 386 colleges for a second consecutive year, included among the top 30 master's universities in the nation by Washington Monthly, as well as ranked on the best bang for the buck list for an eighth consecutive year. Recognized as one of the nation's best colleges in America for quality and affordability by Money Magazine for a sixth consecutive year and named one of America's top colleges and among America's best value colleges by Forbes. You have also helped secure McDaniel's place in the spotlight through your work on the national scene as chair of the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, uh, NICU, it's a fun word to say, as a board member of the American Council on Education and membership with the Maryland Independent College and University Association, MICUA, where you served as chair from 2015 to 2019. And I believe you're currently chairing the Centennial Conference. During your tenure, you have overseen construction and major renovations of Gill Stadium, Angler Dining Hall, WMC Alumni Hall, Raj Student Center, McTeer Zett Plaza, Gill Physical Education Learning Center, Hoover Library, and five residence halls. You also helped secure the largest outright capital gift in the college's history, $5 million for the Raj Student Center. In 2017, we celebrated the college's 150th year as a community and completed a $51 million fundraising initiative in honor of that special anniversary. Your commitment and focus on putting students first have led to many remarkable opportunities for our students. Under your leadership, we created the Center for Experience and Opportunity, our CEO, and single, a single office that's comprehensively supporting experiential learning and the Global Fellows Program, which allows students to internationalize any major. We have also been able to increase our focus and commitment to access and affordability through the creation of scholarships like the Educators, Military, and Alumni Legacies, which offer $100,000 scholarships to all children of educators, veterans, or alumni. We secured the largest scholarship bequest in the college's history, approximately $6 million, which funds the Dorsey Scholars Program, a full tuition room and board scholarship for up to five students. And let's not forget that in the past two years, we were able to welcome the largest and most diverse first year classes in the history of the college. These are all accomplishments that we achieved together in your time as president of McDaniel College. But now I wanna switch gears. We know who President Casey is, but what about Roger Casey? We know you received your master's and PhD in English from Florida State University following your bachelor's degree from Furman University in your home state of South Carolina. You are a first generation college student and a member of Phi Beta Kappa. We know you love to travel and you have been to over 110 countries. Some people joining us tonight may not know this, but you are also a huge fan of the Washington Capitals and NASCAR. You enjoy talking about generational issues in the workplace and your presentations titled Minding the Millennials, Working with Today's Young Adults, and From the Me Gen to the I Gen, the ABCs of the X, Y, and Zs have been requested by multiple organizations. You also authored the book Textual Vehicles, The Automobile in American Literature, and your cultural criticism has appeared in the New York Times, Forbes, The Chronicle of Philanthropy, USA Today, and on CNN, ABC, and CBS. Last and certainly not least, you have been married for nearly 30 years to Robin Allers, who is here with us tonight. You've had incredible success in both your personal and professional life. I know our audience is looking forward to learning more about your journey and hearing more reflections from your time on the Hill. So without further ado, let's jump into some questions from our audience. And as you mentioned, these were sent in ahead of time and I mixed in a couple of my own just for fun. 418 days ago, you made the call to close the campus due to the coronavirus pandemic. Since then, the entire campus community has learned to make a lot of adjustments and a lot of changes. And while I believe most of us are excited to get back to some version of normal, what are some lessons you've learned over the last year plus that you think we should all keep in mind as we work together to create the new normal for the college? Thanks for the introduction, Brandon, and, and thank you again for this opportunity. Um, Wow, this past year, uh, could anyone have imagined that? Uh, I think even in my inaugural address, I talked about the fact that 
we have to be prepared now in higher education for the only reality that is consistent and that is change. And uh, I had no idea that, uh, you know, we would uh, go through the kind of change that we went through in this past year. When you think about the fact that uh, about the first week of March of a year ago, we launched our uh, committee that I can't even remember what it was called then, but it was a committee about the emergency pandemic, the emerging pandemic committee, I think it was. And uh, two weeks later, uh, you know, we realized uh, our only opportunity to complete this school year is if we take this college completely online. And I think at that point in time, we had about 10 undergraduate courses that were online, and that was pretty much it. We closed for a week, and a week later, we relaunched the entire college uh, in a digital format. And um, you know, the greatest thing that I've learned this year is the extraordinary, extraordinary resilience of our faculty and staff. Uh, I have seen people do things that, you know, if, if, if I had thought, let me send you a note and say, this is what you need to accomplish in X amount of time, I would have thought, I can't do that. I can't ask someone to do that. And yet um, our folks did it, you know, and, um, and, and did it without complaining. And uh, when we started realizing that if we want to open this fall, we are literally going to have to start building what a higher education institution looks like from the ground up. Uh, we're going to have to redo the classrooms, got to redo the dining hall. Uh, I think there are over a thousand pieces of signage that went up across campus. Um, we learned that six feet is the length of a green terror. So, you know, we said everybody's got to stay one green terror apart. And so, you know, that became part of our nomenclature here at the college. And then we got through the fall with, I think, only 29 cases. And, uh, and now uh, it's the last week of school. Uh, I don't think any of us the first of last March would have ever believed this could happen, that we could actually make this happen. So the ability of people to, uh, to go beyond uh, and uh, the flexibility of this community to come together because of a common purpose. I knew it was strong, but I think this has been the most incredible test. And I think if we can get through this, we can, we can do anything. One of, the, uh, one of the extraordinary challenges to a pandemic, of course, has also been the disruption of our routines, right? Going to work, going to school, meeting with people, shaking hands, you know, our daily high fives. Um, are, are there daily habits that you've adopted during the pandemic that you've found useful in helping yourself to maintain some semblance of normalcy? Uh, well, I established uh, the third floor turret in the president's house as, as, as the command center, you know, and uh, so it's very interesting now. I actually find it kind of hard to work anymore unless I'm up there. Uh, and uh, that, that's been sort of the most habitual thing that, uh, that I've done. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, for so many months, going to the office, even though it's across campus, really wasn't even a possibility. And that was also because it was under construction uh, when, when Raj was under construction last spring. So um, uh, keeping that routine up, I think, is really impossible. I have really made some things possible. Uh, learning to use this environment and... Um, uh, you know, when I, I, I had never been on Zoom uh, prior to, I'd never even been on Microsoft Teams actually prior to the uh, pandemic. And um, I've really learned there's an incredible amount of virtue in this environment. Uh, and uh, for instance, when we've done smart talks, we bring people from all over the country together. And before it was only our local people who came. Uh, I've been able to stay connected to alumni this way in a way that, you know, I always thought before I've got to go get on an airplane, you know, if I want to see you in California, I have to physically go see you in California. And so that's really sort of helped me, uh, you know, with routine as well. How much of that, um, let me go off the question here for a second. How much of that do you imagine we should be keeping? I mean, that's going to be one of the challenges, right? We're renegotiating what normal means. And uh, I think a lot of us have seen some of the strengths and some of the weaknesses of all of this sort of virtual nation. And as, as someone who has uh, given a lot of talks to a lot of uh, business groups and civic groups about um, the new generation and the, their new employees I would deal with, um, can you maybe opine a little bit about the new 
the new situation that we all have to deal with. Now that we've all learned some of this, or we've all embraced a little bit of this, uh, what should we be carrying forward? What do you think is going to stick with us? Well, I think it, if at the January faculty meeting from a year ago in 2020, I had walked in the room and I have said, everyone in here has to teach online. Um, and I would have probably been run out of the room with a vote of no confidence, you know, because, you know, this is a liberal arts college. This is not what we do. This is not the way it works. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if I had walked into the January 2021 faculty meeting and said, everyone has to teach in person, there would have also been a vote of no confidence, you know, because I, I think our faculty learned that, um, that there are things about this environment that actually do work well with many of our students. Uh, I think that this environment for many of our students is an equalizer assuming that they have access to the technology. And that is a huge assumption because I think one of the other things that we saw, particularly in the early days of this pandemic, is uh, the digital divide is great. And particularly our students when they were in their own homes trying to have access to Wi-Fi and so forth, uh, that was extraordinarily difficult. I mean, you know, it absolutely, uh, it was heartbreaking at the beginning to find out, you know, some of our students were driving to McDonald's, sitting in the parking lot. And then of course we reached out to our alumni and our friends and we came up with an emergency fund and we went out and we got Wi-Fi access for so many of our students who didn't have it. Uh, and so if we can equalize that playing field, I do think that we have some opportunities now in this environment to really expand uh, the connectivity that we have with this generation of students. And our faculty have gotten pretty comfortable in this environment. So I, I think we're gonna be a lot more facile in terms of going back and forth between the so-called real world and so-called virtual world, depending on what, uh, what suits us best at, at, at a particular pedagogical moment uh, in, in our classrooms. So uh, I think that you know, if a computer can do it, the computer should be doing it. And you know, we should be focusing our time and our skills on those pedagogical techniques and approaches with students that are, are of the human kind, that, that, that we can have the kind of touch uh, with our students that can't be replicated in an environment like this. And that's what we ought to spend our class time focused on. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, in addition to the pandemic, the last year has seen an international reckoning with race relations, and the college has not been immune to criticism. The hashtag McDaniel Diaries helped to expose some of the inequities within our community. What were your initial reactions? And looking back, do you think you could have done more to have made yourself more aware of these issues prior to last summer? I wish I knew, I wish I knew my entire adult life what I know now particularly about racism in America, about anti-racist practice, about the experience of so many of our students and our alumni across multiple generations. Clearly interactions were happening between our students and alumni of color from their experience here and, and their experience in our community that, uh, that, that so many of us uh, did not have knowledge about. And, um, I think for much of my career, I have focused on the issue of access and affordability. Uh, diversity has been key to me. Growing up in, in, a, in a town that was sort of half black, half white, right at the beginning of, uh, of, of forced integration in the deep south. I mean, the, these were experiences that I was familiar with and realities that I was familiar with. And honestly, I thought the needle had moved farther in this country. But following the deaths of George Floyd and others and seeing the, the heartbreak of experience that people of color uh, were crying out about in this country. And um, you know, I really realized that uh, our alumni and our students expect more than, uh, than uh, you know, a well thought letter. And you know, this is where my heart is on this issue. Uh, inclusion became a critical issue for me. I wish I could go back 20 years in my career and focus more on issues of inclusion. I wish, I wish Isabel Wilkerson had written CAST 20 years ago. You know, uh, 
following uh, an opportunity after the uh, after uh, George Floyd's death to sit down on, in a virtual environment with alumni of color from across generations and hear their painful narratives uh, for a couple of hours uh, in an event that was just me listening and um, you know one of our faculty members uh, facilitating that conversation. It led me to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with even more of our faculty of color and, and I'm sorry, our alumni of color. And then of course, our faculty, our black faculty wrote a, a, a spectacular, beautiful letter saying, this is what we need to do. You know, this is what we need to focus on. Uh, so I would love to have more years to go back. Uh, you know, I, I think criticism that we faced at that time was absolutely legitimate. And I really hope through the DEI efforts that we focused on this year, um, through our hiring efforts, and, and, and certainly through our efforts to create more diversity in our student body, that we can focus now on a type of inclusion that's going to make uh, alumni, students, uh, and faculty and staff of color really feel much more like they are, are at the table. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know that, I don't know that, uh, that every, everyone understood maybe how much progress hadn't been made or how often progress uh, is, is uh, how fragile it can be and how often it's built on, on some pretty fragile uh, foundations. And these last couple of years, I think for a variety of different reasons have, have really exposed that and, uh, and I think we're seeing that, we're feeling that at the college and we're trying to take some steps and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful um, that the steps we've taken will not, uh, well, they'll, they'll lead us in, in the right path. Um, as, as president, you serve many different constituencies, students, alumni, donors, faculty, staff, not all interests of these groups align with one another. So how do you make decisions that you know will disappoint or anger one or more of these groups? And, and how do you handle those reactions? And if you can think of a couple of examples, um, our questioner would like to hear them. So, uh, you know, one of my favorite definitions of leadership, uh, I first read this in a book by Sharon Parks Dulos. So I'm not sure if she coined it or someone else coined it, but it's leadership is the art of disappointing people at a rate which they can bear. And um, I have come to see there is tremendous truth uh, in that. Um, you know, you, you, as a college president, you, you don't get out of bed in the morning and take your first action without disappointing someone. You know, there is always someone who is critical of some action, something that you do. Uh, and, um, you know, one of the things that I learned uh, in my background in theater was, uh, you know, if you believe your reviews when they love you, you got to believe the reviews when they hate you. So either you're going to be influenced by those reviews or uh, you just don't read them, you know? And that doesn't mean you don't listen to people, but I think you have to have an extraordinary internal locus of control in order to be able to do this job or you are just swayed day to day by, you know, whoever is the last voice uh, that you've heard. Probably the, the most uh, difficult uh, experience in terms of uh, disappointing people uh, that I uh, experienced in, in my time here was going through the curricular review process from a couple of years ago. Uh, I firmly believe this was a process that, that we needed to go through and uh, virtually every college like us in the country needs to go through. It wasn't unique to us. Uh, I felt like we established a very good process. We had a a faculty group looking at an extraordinary array of data. Uh, they met virtually daily for an entire summer. They came back with recommendations to the provost and myself. We then started working with our uh, committees of the board, uh, sharing over a thousand pages of information eventually. Uh, I mean, there, there, were, there were very few executive summaries of this. People wanted to read the data, they wanted to see it all. I know our, our, our board chair uh, uh, now and our board chair then, uh, both Marty and Otto Gunther just you know, devoured the, the information uh, and, uh, and really tried to understand that as we chart a course forward for the college, uh, there are gonna be some very difficult decisions that we made. One of the advantages that we had is that some colleges are doing this so that they can cut their budget. We were actually doing it so we could reinvest those dollars 
in new programs or in programs that we thought uh, there was substantial student interest. And we had a lot of data showing that as well. But nothing prepares you for that backlash when you go public with this is, you know, where we're going to go. Uh, you know, alumni, uh, faculty said you are destroying the liberal arts, you've destroyed the heart of, the co of this college. You know, those are painful things to hear, but ultimately I think uh, I knew and, and our board knew that um, they were the right moves uh, and they were moves that we needed to make uh, to move ourselves forward. Uh, I had any number of conversations with lots of, of alumni. Uh, some of those were, um, uh, I, would, I would call them, you know, professional in the sense we sat down, we agreed to disagree. Some of those were outright attacks. Uh, you know, I had board members tell me I can't go to church anymore because, you know, I'm attacked in the pews by people for, you know, what are we doing to the college? So, you know, there were clearly a lot of emotions in that. Uh, the thing that I thought was comforting about, you know, being attacked, it's hard to say it's comforting being attacked, but you don't act that way if you don't care. I mean, people who do not care about the college uh, would not have taken the time to have the kind of responses they did. So I had to realize I have to appreciate what's, uh, you know, happening here, but I also can't let that stop a process from moving forward. If enough people of goodwill and the leadership and those charged with fiduciary responsibility for the college need to move this issue forward. So, um, you know, we, we survived that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I said to the board, many college presidents cannot survive this process, but it's essential for us to go through it. And, you know, I was very straight up with the board and said, if, if you think I don't have any political capital left when this is over, you're, you're going to need to fire me. I mean, because that's the reality that happens at some institutions. You know, we came out of that. We developed the new programs. We've had the three largest classes in the history of the college. Uh, despite the pandemic, we're in the best fiscal position we've ever been in. And AGB recognized our board with the Nason Award as, uh, as one of the strongest boards in this country. So um, uh, it took a lot of conviction. It took a lot of support by people, but I think it was, a, it was an important leadership lesson. And, and since you've already touched on it, we had another question asking you what you think the top qualities uh, an effective leader should possess, if you could maybe continue on in that direction. Um, you know, I, I can talk about how I've, I've seen in my own, you know, leadership development. And, and to me, um, uh, self-awareness is really critical. Uh, and being uh, understanding the context of where your ins institution is in the context of American higher education is really critically important too. I spend a lot of time, and one of the things that's been so great about NICU and my leadership role there, uh, listening to other college presidents and understanding what's happening on their campuses. Uh, I, I was schooled by uh, you know, one of the greatest college presidents at a liberal arts college in the country. She's on this call tonight, Rita Bornstein. Hello, Rita. Uh, longtime president at uh, Rollins College and wrote the book on presidential leadership. And uh, you know, one of the things that I really learned from her is um, you know, when you look at what's happening at other places, uh, you, you start to understand what's unique about your circumstance and where you sort of fit in in that continuum. And, and then you begin this process of trying to educate your community to that. You know, I, today is Teacher Appreciation Day, and, I, and you know, this was an accident, but I don't think we could have picked a better day, from my opinion, for this conversation. Because when I get up in the morning, I don't see a leader, I don't see a college president, I see a teacher. And I still see a teacher. I mean, that's fundamentally who I, I feel that I am. And you know, one of the things that I think is very important in leadership role is, is trying to teach. Um, and sometimes, you know, like our classrooms, people don't want to learn. You know, they're kind of really happy with the content knowledge they already have. And, and you have to start to stretch them a little bit. Um, uh, speaking of some other qualities I've talked about, uh, uh, the the uh, having a, a you know being centered in in yourself and understanding yourself as well. Um, I uh, was really fortunate that in my 30s I was a Kellogg National Leadership Fellow, 
and I spent about five years with the Kellogg Foundation and an extraordinarily diverse group of, uh, of younger leaders from around the country. And part of the process of that was trying to help uh, you understand how do other people see you? you know, how do they perceive your strengths? How do they perceive your weaknesses? And really get to know those things about yourself. Uh, the other critical thing I think is you've got to surround yourself with great people who are different from you. Uh, and I don't think anybody would ever accuse me of having a senior staff of clones. I mean, they you know, are very different uh, VPs in their own right. We have great relationships with each other. We learn how to argue with each other really well. Uh, you know, I, I, I listen to them uh, and uh, that diversity of perspective is critically important as you're trying to be a leader making decisions as well. Yeah, I'm reminded of uh, an interview that Franklin Roosevelt once gave where he was asked about his decision making process. He said, I'm a juggler. I have everyone throw in their different ideas and you toss them around in a while and you see which one you like the most. If that doesn't work, you pick up another one. And I think that that's um, a quality that a lot, of, uh, a lot of our best leaders end up having to develop if they don't have it already. Um, in, in, a similar, in a similar vein, um, and this is a question that, that I just kind of wanted to know, how does a person know that they want to be a college president? I mean, when do you decide something like that? Do you wake up one morning and think to yourself, I would like to be a college president. I, I can't imagine um, what that internal conversation must have been like. Uh, I think anybody who seriously thinks they want to do this at any point in their career before they've been a dean, uh, I would never want them to be a college president because I, I wouldn't trust them. You know, so uh, I, I um, early in my career, um, well, I'm going to actually back up. My dad uh, is an automobile mechanic. Um, you know, he's still living at at 88. Uh, still has a garage in his backyard. Still works on cars. Um, I grew up believing that uh, you're supposed to fix things. You know, something always needs to be fixed. There's something that's always um, broken or something that can always be improved on. And you, it's, you fix things and you tinker. And that was sort of my initial role model. Uh, and then uh, when I was in college and got very interested in theater, uh, I, I realized I was actually far more interested in being a director than I was in being an actor. And uh, one of the things, the lessons that I learned early on in the theater was that uh, nobody goes to the play to see the director. Uh, so there was this sort of combination of uh, it's okay to do things so that somebody else gets the limelight and you always need to be in this process of fixing things. So I, I sort of had that in me. And when I became a, a professor, one of the things that I was sort of fascinated by with, um, and I don't say this critically, I just say this observationally, you know, I, I would go to like a meeting of departmental colleagues and, you know, people would say, um, you know, wow, it sure is dark in here. And, you know, what's wrong with the room here? We need to get better lights in this room or whatever. And I, they'd argue about that for like 30 minutes and then I would go over and turn on the light switch. Um, you know, there was a lot of conversation about things, but not a lot of doing about things. And, and so I started doing things, you know, and then I got noticed by people in the administration who asked me to do more things. Uh, and um, I started realizing, you know, I like this. I like being able to help get things done. I like being able to facilitate a process. Uh, and um, uh, several people have, have, have said at points in my career, you know, you, you, you're a walking agenda, you know, you're walking along, you run into somebody, you start talking to them about something and, you know, there's always something in your mind about how does this fit here and how does this fit there. So those were sort of personal things that some other people started noticing and then started really helping me hone the kind of skill sets that uh, I think you need to move forward in administration. Um, and, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to become a dean and then a provost at, uh, at Rollins. And um, I learned a, a tremendous amount, uh, as I mentioned, from, uh, from Rita, from, uh, from uh, who became eventually the dean, who was my assistant dean, uh, associate dean, uh, Hoyt Edge, who's on this call tonight. 
Uh, and uh, you know, Hemingway said, I've never met anybody I didn't learn something from. And I really resonate with that. I, I started trying to learn everything I could and sort of put together this patchwork that enabled me to want to move forward. It may be different for other people. Uh, uh, to me, it's not ever been about ambition. It's really been about getting things done. And I think when I've recognized that quality in other people, I've really tried to work with them. And, you know, I've been really fortunate in Julia Jaskin uh, as a provost to see somebody that has that same skill set. You know, she knows how to get things done. She knows how to talk to people. She knows how to work together. And I'm delighted that, you know, she's going to be my successor because I think that's one of the greatest qualities for college president. What, uh, what elements of the job did you least expect when you took over this position? One of the things I say to a lot of people is um, no one prepares you for how much death you deal with when you're a college president. I, uh, I, I you know, you, you're always losing people. You know, whether it's uh, alumni, I mean, like every day you're writing an, a, a letter to someone pretty much uh, that you're sorry that someone's passed away. Uh, you know, the longer you're here, the more of those people you know. Um, the, the illness that you deal with in the community, you know, tragedies that you deal with, uh, student, the loss of students. Uh, uh, and I, I just, there's nothing that prepares you for that. Uh, and uh, certainly the provost job doesn't prepare you for that. And I think that's, that's one of the things about this job uh, that, you know, it's far more like a ministerial job in many ways than it is like a, a political uh, leadership job. But that's been one of the, the biggest is that, that personal side of, and, uh, the other thing that I don't think I was really prepared uh, for and, and realized is um, college presidents actually in most circles get a tremendous amount of respect. Um, and I, I'm, I jokingly say when you're a provost, you really sort of forget that because you're used to nobody gives you any respect. But you know, when you become the president, uh, you uh, in the community, you know, when you're at the grocery store, Half the people know you, even if you don't know them, and particularly when you're in a community this size. Uh, when you go to Washington and you start lobbying and you start talking to elected officials, it was just shocking to me. These people actually think you have credibility. You know what what you say goes a long, long way, and so you really have to learn to be extraordinarily careful with what you say, how you say it in a way that, um, particularly for someone like me who, you know, is, is you know, is, likes humor, kind of loquacious, you, you, you really have to put that in check sometimes. And those are some things that I just never got prepared for very well. Yeah, it's, uh, Capitol Hill might not be the place to try out your one-liners, I guess, uh, especially in the legis legislative session. Um, I guess, uh, so you say that you know the, the job comes with some 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 respect and, and of course tremendous amount of responsibility. What are some of the most frequent misperceptions people have when they find out you're a college president? Um, well, I, I think probably the biggest misperception is people think you actually have some power. I mean, <laughs> you actually. Uh, I mean, the one thing that I've learned in this job more than anything else. I mean, I think I sort of knew this intellectually, but now I know it absolutely is. In this job, there's almost nothing that you can do by yourself, almost nothing. You have to work with someone else. Uh, and, uh, you know, e even something that I love doing, you know, writing speeches, giving public talk, e everything I do, you know, three people in my office have read it. You know, someone else has looked at it. Someone's helped me with it. Um, you know, you, you, you make a phone call, someone helps you with a phone call, you know, you, 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 every sort of decision that you make, you're reliant on, on someone else and, and, and building that trust up. So people often look at this job and they think, wow, that's a powerful job. Uh, but, but the truth is, you know, the power is in other people, the, you know, the power is in coalescing those folks. So that, that's one of the things that I think people are really uh, surprised about. Um, uh, the other thing is that you can actually have a private life in this job. 
you know, so many people said, um, you know, it's, it's a 100% public job, you're in the fishbowl all the time or whatever. I've been astonished how much our students respect mine and Robin's privacy here at the house. You know, they respect uh, privacy in other ways. And um, while every decision you make is absolutely out there and you're only as good as the last one you made, uh, you, you can have a private life in this job. Um, I, I ran into uh, another member of the faculty earlier today who um, said he was looking forward to this. And he said, you know, I, I meant to send in a question. Uh, and he said that, uh, and you, you may or not, may not remember this, but, uh, but he said that he asked you um, back when you interviewed here 11 years ago, he asked you what you plan to do in your first 100 days as president. Um, and now he's wondering, what are your plans for your first 100 days of retirement from being McDaniel's president? <laughs> uh, packing and moving, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, one of the great logistical challenges of, of my life, uh, uh, because there's always been this very clear next job that, you know, there was this transition into immediately. And, and of course, that's not there. Um, uh, one of the very, uh, you know, most important things in terms of this transition is um, uh, my father. Uh, I'm an only child, uh, and my father's been dealing with health issues. Uh, my mother passed away this fall. Uh, you know, I thought in this retirement, I'd still have some time with her, but uh, that's, that didn't work out. Uh, and um, so uh, I, I know that time window is limited. And uh, I intend to take advantage of that. And, uh, you know, I've got a couple of old vehicles that I've had for a long time, and there's still a lot of work to be done on them. So my dad and I have a, have a task uh, that's right here in front of us. Um, the other thing that I'm going to really enjoy that I've actually benefited from in the pandemic because you know the, my social life or the, my social life as president sort of went out the door in the pandemic and suddenly I had this thing called nights available again and uh, I started reading again novels and I was like wow that's why I was an English major and so it's just been a you know, I've just read some spectacular novels this past year and I keep going, how did I miss out on all of this the past 20 years? Yeah, it, it's, um, it's one of those things you sort of take for granted as your way, you work your way up through academia is you spend so much time reading, uh, but you, you don't always have the opportunity to read the things that you might want to read or might otherwise read. But as long as you're on books, um, I know you've read dozens of books on leadership management styles over the years. Some of the ones that, that you've referenced, you know, in to me, uh, Good to Great, uh, the Tao Te Ching, Leadership in the New Science, they've all got different advice, they've all got a lot of interesting advice and so forth. But looking back now that you've done this job for uh, a little over a decade, what are some of the principles and ideas that have served you best from any of these works? Um, and what's one book you might recommend to someone who is stepping into this role now? Uh, well, that book's going to be Rita Bornstein's book on the presidency. There's no doubt. Uh, I already gave Julia the copy. Uh, so uh, uh, the Tao Te Ching has probably been the most uh, sort of unusual choice uh, in, in my life uh, in terms of both teaching and in the leadership in the presidency. And, um, you know, there, there's a Taoist conception that uh, the right thing always happens. So, which is not too dissimilar what I was taught in improv uh, classes in theater, which is that, uh, you know, go to the yes. I mean, it's always, uh, what, whatever you're given, you've got to go to yes. Uh, and, and so you take it and you, you run with that. And um, the, you know, sort of the fundamentals of Taoism have really kind of helped me to really understand that. They've also helped me to understand not doing uh, this whole concept of not doing because uh, you know I, I I'm not a good not doer uh, and and sometimes you have to sit in the silence and let uh, some things evolve and and not take action. Uh, one of my favorite chapters in the the Tao is um, when the master is finished, the students say, "Amazing, we did this by ourselves." So this aspect of learning to take the background uh, and, uh, and be able to, to lead that way. Um, 
Margaret Wheatley, uh, I, I got a chance to know Margaret really well. I, I spent time in the Galapagos with Margaret and, um, and then, you know, her book, uh, Leadership of the New Science came out. And it really helped me understand how concepts like chaos theory, fractal geometry, and so forth can really help us think about new ways to structure and organize uh, uh, any uh, group that we work with. And um, I, I think that book, probably more than any other leadership book, has really opened up my creative thinking. Yeah, creativity is probably one of those things that um, people who haven't spent a lot of time in leadership roles might take for granted uh, just how important creativity is. And, and someone like yourself with a background in, in literature and theater, um, can you talk a little bit about the role that creativity plays in, in your leadership style? Yeah, I, I, um, I really think creativity is rooted in curiosity. Uh, and, uh, you know, so just about every time I get a chance to talk to our first year students or graduating seniors, I, I talk to them about cultivating a, a life of curiosity. Um, Part of that might be, uh, you know, the, the English professors uh, become college presidents more than any other uh, uh, degree area. Uh, and I think political science is second, but it's partly because I think we, we actually don't have a field. You know, we, we sort of acquire a little history, a little political science, a little philosophy, a little religion, and we put it all together. Uh, I am fascinated by the liberal arts. You know, I... Uh, as, as an only child growing up and, you know, not exactly having the, the, the most cultural opportunities available in the world to me, when I got to college, it was just remarkable because I was exposed to things I had never even thought about in my life, never seen in my life. And, um, you know, it was so great. I, I, you know, spent the next 40 years in college because, uh, there's not a single member of our faculty, there, there's not a single staff member that I wish, I, I wish I had the time to sit down with them and find out more about what it is they do, what it is they study. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just really fascinated by that. And uh, I think creativity happens when you start creating connections with the, the curiosity that leads you to explore different ways and different directions. And, um, uh, so I credit curiosity probably more than anything else with the ability to create sort of a patchwork and seeing things in a different way or figuring out, you know, well, you know, Bryn thinks that and Julia thinks this and Amy thinks that and we thought about let's put them together and then, uh, you know, that's sort of the process that we use to come up with our strategic plan. We just kept throwing those ideas out and then trying to figure out what can connect together like a picture puzzle. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm glad you bring that up as, uh, as, as part of the, um, the sort of the liberal arts mission, because um, I wanted to ask that, you know, you've spent a lot of your time over the last decade and even longer advocating for the liberal arts and the centrality of the liberal arts within higher education. Uh, what is it you find so compelling about the liberal arts for the world we live in right now? Uh, well, I sort of back to the first question you ask. I mean, the only certainty is change. And... Um, when you have the ability to take the disciplinary perspectives of the different fields of literature, philosophy, mathematics, biology, um, we have the ability to take those kinds of frameworks and, and use them to theorize about uh, uh, something that changes and, and now you're unfamiliar and how do I figure my way through this? Uh, it just gives you such a better structure to do that than if you are intensely trained in just one technical area. Um, you know, one of the things that I love the most about international travel is you go to a country that you've never experienced uh, the language, you, you don't know much about the food, you know, you've read in, in guidebooks, but you know, you haven't had that on your own. And that's where I find this, the richness of liberal arts enables you to start figuring out how do I understand what these people are doing? How do I understand what's important culturally here? How do I not uh, embarrass myself or embarrass themselves? And ask really the, the right kind of fundamental questions. So whether it's interacting with people of difference, whether it's interacting with different ideas or change, those disciplinary perspectives, I, I just don't think there's anything that gives you the base like the liberal arts do. 
You know, I tell all of our prospective students when they come on a visiting student day in the fall, uh, I don't know if McDaniel's the right place for you. I hope it is. But the most important thing I can tell you is as an undergraduate, get yourself a liberal arts education. It's going to change your life and it's going to prepare you for whatever you want to do. Thanks for that um, perspective. That's a, that's a really wonderful way to look at it. Um, I know we're starting to get a little bit close to the end of our time. So I'm going to ask you a couple of, saved a couple of shorter ones for you here to the end. Um, if you hadn't taken a career path into academia, what other career would you have been interested in and why? Uh, it would probably have been theater. Uh, it, uh, as, you know, I, Stand up would have been a good challenge or improv, um, but I, you know, my dad instilled in me too much of the "you've got to earn a living," you know. So I, uh, uh, you know, I think I was too chicken to take the theater route. You know, I wanted something that had more more stability uh, in it. Uh, as I think about, okay, if I just completely started over with something uh, as an undergraduate, what might I want to do? Uh, it might be art history, you know, I particularly because of Robin's work uh, 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 as the director of an art museum and then, you know, our, our own experience in, uh, in art galleries and, and museums around the world. Uh, I am um, absolutely amazed by the ability of great art to communicate without using verbs and nouns, you know, which is how I'm, I've been trained to communicate. And I would love to understand that uh, even more. Uh, we did get a question. Someone said they remembered you saying that you wanted to be an astronaut maybe when you were a kid. Um, and, and now that we're starting to make some more trips into space and we've had some, some great things, uh, where are you thinking all this exploration might lead us? I so much still want to get into outer space. Uh, yeah, so uh, you'll have to talk to Robin about that. I mean, I was, uh, uh, I absolutely wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid because of course I grew up right in the middle of the Apollo uh, era. Uh, when I had to get glasses, I think I was in the fourth grade, I cried for a year because back then astronauts couldn't wear glasses. Uh, I was so excited when the two guys went up in the first SpaceX launch two years ago because one of them had worn glasses his entire life. And I'm like, yes, I have a chance now. You know, There's some other health issues that might get in the way of them letting me sign off and get in a space capsule. Uh, but I am obsessed with space. Uh, I keep all the launches on my calendar. Uh, and, uh, you know, Marissa, uh, or uh, I think Jeff's on the call tonight, my former assistant, uh, Tamara, uh, that worked with me, all of them will tell you. So why does he have the word launch on his calendar? Uh, because, uh, you know, Robin and I have a place at Cape Canaveral. You see these beautiful shots, you know, right from our balcony. And now when SpaceX comes back and lands on the ground, it literally is right in front of us, you know. It's 17 miles away, but it's right in front of us. So uh, I, I don't know why, but I am still absolutely obsessed with space. Um, so since you haven't had a chance to go up to the ISS, favorite place you've ever traveled? Um, probably Antarctica. Uh, there is space nothing. Right? <laughs> there is nothing like the Antarctic on this planet. Uh, we're losing it. Uh, I tell anybody who doesn't believe in global warming, go to the Antarctic. If you can go there and not believe in global warming, you also don't believe in anything you see. Uh, and because the change is happening so rapidly. But, it, you know, it's, the, it's a continent that has no one living on it other than the, the scientists. You know, it is in so many ways, uh, you know, our, our unspoiled universe. Uh, its uniqueness, its geography are, are absolutely, uh, uh, just absolutely amazing. Uh, and the last couple questions here, um, I think I might know the answer to this one. Who has been your greatest mentor? Wow, that, they, there are so many people that I would uh, name. Um, you know, I, I, I've talked about my father in the sense of, uh, of a life uh, style. I, I've talked about Rita in terms of looking at a college president and going, this is the kind of college president I'd want to be. Um, 
I, I, I look at, uh, at, at Hoyt Edge, my former colleague uh, here from, uh, from Rollins, who was, uh, uh, you know, a, a 30 plus member of faculty there. And uh, I learned uh, so much from him when I was a provost about committing uh, a life to the same institution. You know, we, we, we briefly celebrated Ethan Seidel's retirement today after 52 years of commitment to this place. And, and you know, there's a part of me that's like, wow, I, I wish I could have done 52 years in one place, you know, in the sense of that, that, that that's really a, a tremendous sense. Uh, I, I have learned so much from working with, uh, with Julia Jaskin uh, and uh, that, that, that partnership has been just absolutely spectacular. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I really feel like, you know, I'm, I'm a part of everybody that I've met in my life and I, I owe those people so much for where I am. Yeah, I knew I knew you're going to throw your dad in there because I've heard you speak of him before and you have such great respect and reverence for the man. So uh, I figured that would be part of that answer. Um, and just to wrap things up here. Um, top five favorite moments uh, or perhaps a proudest accomplishment uh, looking back on your 11 years. Uh, the affordability and access aspect of the college. Um, I did not think that during my presidency, we would cross over into uh, uh, having a, a majority of students uh, of color. Uh, and uh, that uh, I, I feel great about the process that we went uh, through to make that happen. And, uh, you know, there's so much more work to be done on the inclusion front. There's, there's no moment for celebration in that, but it is something that I feel great about. I feel great about the opportunities we created for middle-class families with our legacy scholarship program. Uh, that was uh, such a, an amazing uh, opportunity to, to the children of educators, to, you know, $100,000 to come here. Everybody says, how many of those scholarships do you have? You know, we say it's unlimited. What's the hook? There's no hook. Uh, and I, I feel wonderful about that. Um, when I came here, I thought I, I want us to be in the Princeton Review and I want to be number one at something. Somebody needs to recognize us as number one. So making the Princeton Review and then becoming the number one US News in the North School, uh, Best Value School, uh, that is a, 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 great, uh, a great feeling as well. Um, on a recurrent basis, the joy that I feel every time Robin and I have students and alumni in our house the, the pain of not having that this past year. I mean, that's of, of the, all the things, it's the greatest sense of loss. That's been a great sense of loss, but we have such amazing students, such amazing alumni. Uh, I learned so much from them every time that I'm with them. Uh, I, I just really, uh, that's probably what I'm going to miss most about the presidency is that opportunity to, on a constant daily basis, connect with so many spectacular people. Well, that's a, that's a great place to, for us to, to bring our uh, conversation to a close. So thank you um, so very much for sharing your story and especially for your willingness to address some of the more challenging things you faced along the way. Your story is certainly one that emphasizes the power of a liberal arts education. As president of McDaniel College, you've led us through both difficult times and celebrations. I'm sure it hasn't always been easy, but you should feel very proud of all that we've been able to accomplish together as a community under your leadership. And on behalf of the McDaniel College community, I just want to thank you and Robin for your 11 years of dedicated service. Your efforts on behalf of our students have helped change so many lives and will have a lasting impact here on the Hill. So I'll turn the floor back over to you for your final remarks uh, to the audience, but thank you very much. Thunderous applause. You can hear it rising from the Zoom laptops all across the country. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Bren. First of all, to you, I appreciate so much uh, uh, you're doing this tonight. You're a phenomenal scholar and faculty member, and, and it, it was an honor for you to be here. Uh, I, um, I, wa I wanna say thanks also to the folks in my office uh, to, for all the work behind this and for the idea. Uh, Katie, Marissa, uh, Jenny, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, I, I, got, I get to work with the greatest, greatest board of trustees. Uh, you, know, don't, you don't have to ask me, AGB already recognized them as best board in America. 
Uh, and uh, I, I want to thank uh, Otto. Uh, I want to thank you and Marty particularly for your board leadership. I want to thank Mary Lynn Durham because I wouldn't be at this college if you hadn't come down to Florida and said, I want you to come to, to McDaniel. And, uh, you know, you introduced me to this place. You told me about Arizep. You told me how your life was changed. And uh, that day, my life was changed, too. So I, I, I appreciate that so much. To our extraordinary faculty, to our incredible students, uh, it has been an honor. Every day has been a privilege. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going away. So uh, uh, I got a year of sabbatical. I'm really hoping to be able to work it out to go over to Budapest, do us some good uh, at our campus there, and uh, perhaps have some more opportunities to teach some of these great students that I've gotten to know over dinner over the years. So thank you all for being here tonight. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in three dimensions so much. I appreciate it.